to the ligament or the posterior neurovascular injury also may be there but the biggest uh, disadvantage is you have to go for the second surgery that you have a potential need for the hardware removal so in my point of view suture fixation is better than the screw fixation so let's start with the case of 18 year male presented to with us with the pain and swelling of the right knee after one week of the rda and initially patient have a tenderness and a fusion distal neurovascular defect and detailed clinical examination was not possible but once patient was under after one week uh, we have a lachman test was positive the resveratrol were negative fever shift was negative so it was an isolated tibial spine avulsion fixation uh, tibial spine injury we done the radiological examination evaluation of this patient the, on the plane radiograph in the left upper corner there is a tibial eminence fracture that is the displaced one we done the ct scan mri as well see to rule out the geometry and the combination and the displacement of the uh, intercranial eminence fracture as you can see in the coronal and the sagittal view it is displaced fracture we also done the mri to rule out the other condylar injury intermeniscal um, ligament meniscus injury ligament injury so there was a gross fusion and the tibial eminence was fractured and the rest of the structures were normal so as we have decided for the osteoscopy fixation first of all we will done the standard portal that is anterolateral anteromedial and one accessory anteromedial portal that will be used for the suture management to structure of the sutures once you have done the anterolateral portal just pass the trochar cannula and before passing the arthroscope before passing the arthroscope evacuate the hematoma otherwise once you pass your scope it will be blinded off because of the large hematoma has you, you have to evacuate it first before going to the arthroscopy second is there you all can use the 60 cc or the irrigation tubing but don't use the pump hair because pump have a lot high 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 pressure that may lead to the compartment pressure increase the compartment and may lead to the compartment syndrome so that you can have to check frequently the calf muscle of the patient to avoid the compartment increase in compartment pressure so once you have uh, vacated the hematoma your diagnostic round will be started so first of all use a probe to see the fracture fragment and also look at the Terminal attachment of the ACL, uh, medial meniscus, lateral meniscus, and any other associated chondral injury or the ligament injury. Do your diagnostic round completely. Once you have done it, then use the arthroscopic shaver, and the arthroscopic shaver will be uh, used to evacuate the hematoma, scar tissue from the fracture bed or the fracture crater. And tentative fix a reduction of this crater will be a fragment will be checked by the probe if it is fitting into the crater so you have clear the fracture crater so once it is cleared from the and tentative reduction was assessed use a suture lasso along with the passing wire or wire loop at the junction of the acl uh, to near this attachment to the bone you can see in the left uh, upper photo we have uh, passing the suture lasso with the fiber wire and retrieve this passing wire or wire loop from the accessory anteromedial portal that you have for the suture management and use this accessory uh, portal and once you have pull it out load this with the number 2 fiber wire suture and retrieve this suture from the medial portal that will later on will be used to pass on the tibial side and do fixation of this fracture fragment as you can see that in the lower photo the number 2 fiber wire has already passed from the acl segment segment so once you have cleared the hematoma and deal with the acl insertion uh, and passing the lasso and fiber wire and then the suture no you have to come on the tibial side just give a 2 cm incision on the proximal tibia and from medial aspect and uh, pass uh, take a standard tibial acl drill and pass two uh, drill holes one on the medial and one on the lateral side of the attachment of the acl so once you have passed it take and take 16 cc uh, 16 uh, gauge needle or final needle and pass it from the anteromedial aspect to the joint line and once you have seen this needle in the joint line pass the same uh, fire passing fiber wire or a wire loop through this portal and retrieve this portal from the anteromedial portal 
that intermediate portal you have already passed the fiber wire or suture wire load this retrieving wire or on, on this uh, number two fiber wire suture and retrieve it or pull it through the intermediate portal so the fiber wire and the suture wire that you have already passed from the acl is now retrieve on the intermediate aspect of the tibia that will be used to for the reduction of the tibial eminence fracture so this is a video that how you shuttle the uh, uh, or so you have seen in this video uh, once both ends of the fiber wire that you have already passed from the in joint to the anteromedial aspect are retrieved and these will be used to for the traction and reduction of the tibial eminence fracture once they are and once the both the ends are available and you have tentatively checked with the probe and the fiber wire as well that this is an anteromedially reduced then you have to fix it on the anteromedial aspect you can uh, fix it with the endo button or a screw or you can use the suture bridge that you have already made so you can see in this radiograph there is a uh, fracture fragment is anatomically reduced it's anatomically reduced stable and it will lead to the early mobilization of this patient so post op rehabilitation protocol for this patient is uh, we have put the patient for the first two week was immobilized with the long knee brace and to touch weight bearing was only allowed and after 2 to 4 week within 2 to 4 week gradual weight bearing as tolerated by the patient and passive range of motion exercise will be continued and after 4 week active knee range of motion exercises and quadriceps stretching and stretching techniques exercises will be continued but the pre injury level of activity will be after the 6 month of this whole rehabilitation program there are lot of studies available uh, that show that a uh, clinical outcome of arthroscopic suture fixation for the tibial fracture and dirt is have a better outcome in comparison to the open or in comparison to the uh, screw fixation that may be need uh, as you no know, there have a decreased chances of uh, need for the hardware mole for the second surgery of the patient so in my point of view or uh, the study or literature i have seen that the clinical outcome have a better outcome with the suture fixation this was all about the case of uh, arthroscopic fixation of the tibial laminus thank you so much uh, thank you dr amir you are uh, mashallah well in time and um, it was a nice uh, presentation on uh, the spine evolution i hope everyone gets the point and understands what we are doing so uh without uh, taking the questions right now and uh, people are joining in on um, we have 35 participants so far so we'll proceed to dr umar but uh, uh, about the review in acl mate pc so dr umar if you can hear me please you can uh, take a start if you are ready yes i am just let me share the screen somebody else have to stop sharing screen so i can yeah Yeah, Dr. Ahmed, please stop. So, can you guys see the slide? Yes, yes, uh, we can see the slide. You can start. Thanks very much. So, first of all, uh, Osama, thanks very much, and everyone uh, for organizing the show. Uh, these are the hospital I work. I won't go into detail what I do. Few people know me already. So, failed ACL reconstruction is obviously a different ball game. uh the reason being that if you look into detail about what acl reconstruction entails this is the fact that almost 200000 acl reconstruction is now performed in usa 90000 in uk we still don't have a real time data how many we do in pakistan and how many are arthroscopic and how many are open but we know one thing from the clear evidence that if you have an acl injury and if you have acl injury with meniscal injury and cartilage injury you do have a very high risk of developing arthritis so with 10 years follow up study done in castor published 2013 and few recent studies clearly identified that if somebody has got an acl lesion 
and leaves it alone and continue playing sports, he is carrying 10 years, almost 20% risk of developing osteoarthritis. And if somebody has got ACL injury and meniscal injury and cartilage injury, this number doubles up to 40%. So somebody at the age of 20, when he will go to age of 30, he'll have a 40% risk of developing arthritis. So we must have to consider offering them either treatment or preventing them from playing the competitive pro sports. So, but what is failure? That's the main thing we need to ask. Is it an objective laxity? Is it patient perception of instability that patient feel unstable knee after reconstruction? Is it a post-op stiffness and pain? Is it weakness of extensor mechanism or is it a deep seated infection? The incidence of primary failure of ACL reconstruction is shown to be between five to 10%. I'm sure this number has gone down now in the last 10 years because of advances in orthobiologics, much more higher quality of ACL reconstruction, better equipment. But we need to know that is it before six months or after six months to plan the revision easy. Mars Group published a very interesting paper. It's a very good paper and I would recommend all the juniors to read. They looked into educational level, activity level, gender, age, technical, graft used, and meniscal and cartilage injury. I picked up two things from it. What's the activity level that leads to re-injury? Sports was most, most higher among that, followed by the rest of the things. But the technical fact was most important. Femoral tunnel malposition leads to 80% risk of developing failure. Tibial tunnel malposition, almost second on the number, followed by malalignment, femoral fixation, tibial fixation. And interestingly, this study was done in 2010. And at that stage, ALL was not part of it. Maybe now it will be. If you look at these three graphs, these three boxes, it will make life easy of a surgeon who does ACL reconstruction on a regular basis. Somebody who has got problem in biology and he has got a trauma, he is much more higher likely to develop re-injury of the ACL or rupture. If somebody has got technical error and developed trauma can also fail. And all these three contributing factors can develop much more higher risk of re-injuring. So when you are preparing patient for ACL reconstruction, you need to keep in mind biology. And the second most important factor is technical ability to perform ACL reconstruction at the right place. Because you have to do it right at, on the first go. So what happens if it is less than six months? Do we need to see that if the knee never felt stable? Was it poor initial graft tensioning? Was it failure of initial fixation? Was it incorrect, incorrect graft placement? And if it is over six months, we need to look at, was it a new trauma? Was it a biological failure of incorporation? Or insufficient secondary restraint, either meniscal tear, which was left behind or not repaired? Recently, Intrust has developed more toward posterior tibial slope. It is an angle that is formed between a line perpendicular to the mid diaphysis of the tibia and posterior inclination of the tibial platter. We all use it during total knee replacement. De Jour doesn't need any introduction. He has published quite a lot of work on it. And he mentioned in his study that every 10 degree increase in posterior slope, an addition of six millimeter of anterior tibial translation can be expected in both ACL intact and ACL deficient knee. Study done by Lee, published in 2014, a series of 181 patients, which is quite a big series. In their study, they look at the tibial slope and found that their study demonstrated that the medial tibial slope, five degree or greater, resulted in an odd ratio of ACL failure up to 6.8 and lateral sided almost 10.8% failure. Leo Pichinsky from Australia published his work that if within 12 degree or greater, Posterior tibial slope can lead to much higher risk of ACL re-injury, leading to almost 59%. In order to address that, Dijor published his work showing that in nine patients who underwent second revision ACL reconstruction study combined with tibial deflection osteotomy, the risk was reduced. So deflection osteotomy can be considered in someone who has got much more higher tibial slope, 12 degree or more. And this is something I think which will consider quite important in next coming years. Influence of alignment is very important. If somebody has got malalignment, they will have much more stress onto the graft and the failure will be much higher. And alignment correction with reconstruction is important. Like in this guy, which I did in England, he had varus knee, we did ACL reconstruction and proximal tibial osteotomy 
without any bone grafting and he did well. So what do you look for when somebody comes with an ACL reconstruction and that has failed? You need to plan from out to in. Look at physical examination, do radiological investigation, watch how they walk, look at their alignment clinically, do clinical examination. Detailed physical examination is important. In open surgery, they have multiple scar. It's difficult to then harvest the graft. You do clinical examination and then you do physical examination. I won't go into detail because most of you no basic physical examination of the knee joint. The radiograph is important to look at the metallic screw positioning or any loose body. And I always like to do long leg alignment view in a patient in which I'm performing revision cases. MRI scan and CT scan will give us much more insight into cartilage and meniscal tear and also osteolysis if you use CT scan. Let's look at what happens when there is a problem with the femoral tunnel and tibial tunnel. If the anterior tunnel is, if the femoral tunnel is too anterior on a primary ACL reconstruction, what will happen? That there will be tightness, inflection, and graft will, attenuation will happen and rupture. Management, either you can drill a separate tunnel, you can do two incision techniques, stack interference screw, means putting one screw over other, or do two-stage revision, which is my choice. Vertical femoral tunnel, majority of ACL surgeons who have seen, who have done a lot, know that in Pakistan, if you do open ACL, you majority of time see vertical tunnels. And that can cause sagittal stability, but rotational instability. And you follow the same principle by revising. What happens on the tibia side? If the graft is too anterior, the graft will impinge and there will be a loss of extension. If the graft is too medial, in the middle video, as you can see, the graft is coming from the tibial articular surface, there will be loss of extension. And if the graft is too posterior, the patient will have no rotational control, like seen on the MRI scan. For example, this. In this MRI scan, you can see the ACL graft is coming almost close to the PCL, and this patient will have knocking effect, pain, and loss of mobility. So what's the management of tibial tunnel? You can follow the same principle as on the femoral side, or do two-stage revision reconstruction. So what are the choices when you plan to do revision ACL? Do you use an autograft or do you use allograft? There is definitely now evidence to support that allograft has got much higher failure rate in revision cases in Pakistan. We don't have availability of allograft or synthetic graft and our choices are autograft. But what is the outcome based on revision? Important is you go in, if you look at this guy, he had chronic failed ACL followed by infection and that happens to the knee, the cartilage gets damaged. Early revision, 24% risk of damage. Late revision, 52% of chondral damage. So much, much higher risk if you delay it. So you have to go in, fix it early. Return to play, because that's something which a lot of patients will ask you. So the studies have shown not a brilliant chance that you will go back to that fitness level, but still not bad, especially almost in, in a younger population, 74 to 62%. But important is that you determine the patient definition of success. The primary goal when you're doing revision is to stabilize the knee, prevent meniscus and cartilage damage, and maximize functional level. You need to have realistic expectation. This guy was a pro, under 19 uh, cricket player. He had open ACL followed by infection, followed by arthrofibrosis. I was honest with him. I did scar tissue release, removed the graft, did multiple PRP, MUA, physiotherapy, and now he's mobilizing independently without stick, but he's unable to play sports because of so much damage to the knee joint. So what's my approach? I do two-stage revision. I remove all the fibrous tissue. I visualize the tunnel. I use eyelid crest bone graft. CT scan skin six months and then plan the revision. As you can see, I always prepare the eyelid crest. My choice nowadays for revision, second stage is peroneus longus because I feel that's a good graft. I feel these patients um, do very well with it. We have finished our randomized control trial and it's underway for publication, hopefully very soon. But that's my choice of graft for revision. Let's look at case one, 21 year old male, acute injury, he's a policeman uh, playing football, primary ACL reconstruction done in 2016. These were one of the few early uh, revision cases I've done when I started working in Pakistan. Continuous pain and instability. You can see that the graft and the tibial screw is not in the right place. When I looked at the uh, arthroscopic examination, if you look, it's coming out almost from the tibial articular surface next to the meniscus. This patient had a large, almost uh, four to five millimeter hole on the tibial articular surface actually should have come from here and the screw was loose so we had to remove everything we did first stage by doing bone grafting i like to pack the bone graft tightly 
so that these patients will have nice incorporation, as you can see, and then the tibial bone graft was fixed. CT scan was done six months, and I did revision using BTB graft, and now this is his condition. I think this is not eight months now, he's almost four years or four and a half, five years down the line, but he just sent me this video showing that he's doing quite well. Second case, 24-year-old male, exactly on the same time he came to me, open ACL with BTB, post-op instability and pain. 2017, we did the arthroscopic removal of screws and bone grafting. First stage revision, as I mentioned, exactly the same planning, remove the screw, pack it with the graft. You have to pack it well, do the meniscal repair if required. And then I did second stage uh, using hamstring. And as you can see, nice, beefy and juicy graft. Using end button on the top, I used PRP in most of my patients now. And this is his condition. We are getting a lot of noise, uh, Osama, at the background. And yeah, then now this is his condition. On. So he's doing quite well. So in summary, excuse me. Can you hear me, guys? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. You can start. So in summary, determine the cause of primary ACL reconstruction failure. That is really important. And the key to successful revision is to determine patient's symptoms. Knee instability should be the primary indication for the revision reconstruction. Determine all relevant comorbidities, careful physical examination, and review all relevant imaging studies. I think my slide is not moving for some reason. Here we go. And important is that you have to have a realistic expectation. Not every candidate is suitable for revision. You need to be very good primary ACL reconstruction surgeon to embark on the journey of revision because they will hunt you down. So be very careful when you're offering patient revision. You need to learn it well and you need to do it well on the first time so the patient doesn't have higher failure rate. Thank you very much. And Best wishes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Umar. Uh, very nice talk, especially I like the way you elaborate things and uh, put everything together to make us understand. Very beautifully uh, presented. So now uh, that takes us to another interested, uh, very interesting topic uh, by Dr. Sufyan, which is multi-ligament knee injuries. Uh, uh, he wants to speak on his technique on. Uh, uh, doing multi ligaments in uh, Lakhat National Hospital, Karachi. So, Dr. Sufyan, uh, can you hear me? Ji, uh, uh, Sama, I can hear you. Can everyone hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Everyone is mute, so you can start over. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon to everyone in Pakistan yeah. and good morning to in uh, the UK. So, uh, I'll be starting uh, with my talk regarding the multi ligament knee reconstruction. And it will, it's, a, it's a pleasure to actually speak on something besides uh, COVID these days. I hope everyone is safe and well uh, in this pandemic. So, uh, this, uh, I'll start by uh, putting this uh, the challenging uh, the topic that once uh, you have to start with the multi ligament re uh, knee reconstruction, you should actually be having enough experience and expertise and actually you develop a teamwork and knowledge in terms of your research work. Plus you should have mastered all your techniques of doing your arthroscopic ACL, your PCL reconstruction, the all inside technique, the extra articular reconstruction of the MCL, the, the PLC reconstruction, plus the uh, fixation of uh, the meniscus, the uh, from any part from uh, either the root avulsion or the fixation or the chondral injuries because in these uh, difficult cases, you can come across any of the situation while you're actually doing it. Uh, so, uh, coming to the definition, this uh, effort, uh, the review was actually published in March 2020, according to which the, the, the multi-ligamentous uh, the definition says that they need to have at least two of the four ligaments needs to be injured in order for you to label your patient for the uh, multi-ligamentous uh, knee injury. And uh, we actually follow the, uh, the classical Schneck classification, which was actually uh, came uh, into publication in, in 1990s, but still being used in which KD1 being the multi-ligamentous, including the injury to the one ligament, two to two of the cruciates, three being your both the cruciates plus your MCL, and the uh, L being the cruciates plus PLC, and four means your old global sort of injuries inside the knee. Well, if you look at the PubMed literature, you, it is very interesting to see that the literature actually started to rise from early 1990s. 
and it is uh, since the 2008 and 9 that multi uh, that many papers actually start pouring in regarding the uh, the multi ligament reconstruction but all the data that we actually see are level 3 4 or above or a 5 uh, sort uh, uh, of uh, review and none of them is a level 1 or level 2 study which will actually help you in coming up to that so uh, there, there, this the treatment stays uh, very much varied in uh, in the literature, and there have been very much controversies in the optimal management. What type of management should be there, depending upon the results. Now, uh, the, uh, obviously, for a multi-ligamentous knee reconstruction, you need to have a knee dislocation, and plus, you when the, whenever the knee is dislocated, you need, initially have to follow the algorithm in order for you to save a limb. Uh, first, and actually, there is also a 25% chance of showing a perineal palsy inside of these patients. So you need to actually work into that area before you you actually dealing with your acute sort of knees. Either you have to still put them in your back in your external fixators or back slaps in order for you to save the limb, and then say so yeah, after uh, when you are actually planning to reconstruct, then the controversy actually starts. Now, what are the main management options, whether conservative or surgical, timing of surgery, what type things should be considered before the time, whether you should repair structure, either you use a single stage surgery or use a multi-level surgery. Now, initial data, interestingly, actually showed many papers on conservative treatment as well, but uh, this uh, paper of 2020 E4 review actually have actually randomized the studies and in 2004 and onwards, their people have started seeing that they, yeah, they have reached the consensus that at least operative criteria does show better results outcome in terms of your IKDC scores and less omni scores. But again, does uh, what uh, is, uh, managing all the, these patients uh, surgically will have a better outcome? They don't know about that. Still, that's a question. Regarding timing of surgery, three stages, if you uh, study the literature, people have actually attempted that into acute stage versus delayed. Acute is that you fix everything within three weeks. Stage means you, you look after your collaterals first and leave your cruciates and delayed means you leave everything and you come back when the injury is, is very much old and then you can actually go on and reconstructing your, your, your patients in a, in a comfortable sort of environment. Now, there have been pros and cons. Early surgical management has been actually being uh, done by many people who actually uh, debate that early putting bad early into knee range of motion is good for the knee. But again, there are disadvantages of developing a compartment syndrome. Plus, there's higher knee, of, uh, knee deficit inflections and, uh, and there's a very high risk of developing arthrofibrosis. Again, now one thing is to be considered that if you're going in early, you actually lose your time and you actually, uh, you are not giving time for your structures just like your MCL to actually heal. So actually you lose your time in terms of terms for the normal natural healing uh, to actually take place. Plus it has been shown theoretically in the data that the corners actually show better in terms of reconstruction rather than repairs whenever you are actually looking at your, uh, your, your in, in retrospect towards your repairs. So again, single stage versus a double stage surgery. Now people have been actually doing it in a stage sort of environment. And again, this paper showed that some of the, the systemic reviews, again, level four and level three, shows that the stage reconstruction show a little bit better in terms of knee and IKDC scores. So actually they are more towards staged versus delayed reconstruction into be there. Now, Coming to the challenges, well, you, when you are actually taking up these cases, what are the challenges? You need graft. Now, what are the grafts that we are actually left with? In, as in Pakistan, we don't have a, a tissue bank that uh, Dr. Umar has actually mentioned before. So we had only the challenge of looking, of working through hamstrings, your BTB grafts, and your cordyceps tendons, which are available inside your name, uh, in for taking from uh, all from the autograph, as we lack actually uh, uh, to actually import it from uh, the rest of the world, and we don't have a, a established tissue bank to actually use it. So how do we do it? What are the techniques that we actually develop? We actually devised a delayed technique and because of the uh, the thing that we want every structure to get healed because we don't have much uh, ligaments with us, we actually planned a single stage surgery. We used autographs, we used scanograms in each of the patient and we selectively choose our patient who has actually developed at least full range of knee of motion once after uh, going through the episodes of dislocation. Plus we actually took consent and took uh, harvested the graft from both the limbs in order for us to actually uh, do with our reconstruction. So I'll start with uh, my uh, few of my cases. I'll start with uh, the KD4, which is the most complex type of knee injury. The, it was a young individual who came with uh, all the corner, the both the cruciates and both the uh, the collateral injuries of ACL, PCL, PLC injuries. 
He had no uh, vascular injury. The distal neurovascular status was intact. This was the radiograph showed good cartilage. Plus, there is an avulsion fracture of the MCL, which was there. You can appreciate that there the, the cruciates are basically injured. There you can see there is no ACL, PCL. The PLC structure is, is gone. It's ex completely excluded MCL uh, uh, ligament, which is there. So what we did, we actually planned for a multi-ligamented single stage surgery. We planned to do the PCL, uh, the ACL, then your PLC and your MCL deconstruction. We harvested the graft from both sides. We took all the four hamstrings. We took the, the, quadri the, uh, the, uh, the quadriceps tendon from the ipsilateral limb. We started with the PCL, we constructed the PCL first, then we did the ACL with the quad tendon, then we went out for to do our extra the, the collaterals. So we did a modified Larson approach because of the limitation of the tendon to do your PLC, plus we did an MCL reconstruction with the remaining hamstring graft that we have to actually give them uh, the, 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 the normal structure. So this is the endo button for PCL. This goes for MCL, the, the posterior oblique ligament, the AD and the, 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 the middle structure, the, quarter, the ACL, uh, and this is the PLC for the Larson loop technique that we actually use. Now, 12 weeks post-operatively, the patient actually showed a good varus stress, a good valgus stress, a little bit of laxity of, for the ACL, but interestingly, his PCL actually showed good results. And the patient was actually mobilized, a full weight bearing uh, in, uh, afterwards. So 28 weeks follow-up, the patient was actually able to squat and perform his regular prayer kneeling activities. That is the most norm during, in, in our part of the world, uh, other than going back to sports and revealing their normal activities. So another uh, patient is a 27 years old uh, uh, chap. He came to us with ACL, PCL, PLC. So it's a KD3L. Uh, the lateral side, the PLC injuries, the radiographs, the, 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 these are the radiographs. You see the cruciates being torn, plus you see that the PLC is actually excluded, there's uh, laxity. Now, in this uh, uh, patient, we actually found a root evulsion of the, the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So, we planned to do the, 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 the evulsion, root evulsion fixation first using a lasso, and we used a button outside the patient. We actually did the, then the PCL, then we actually with the with the with the hamstring particle graft, and we did an AC with the ACL with the triplet uh, graft because at the thickness of the tendon we were lucky to actually find a good thick tendon. Then these are the, the tunnels in C. We use the divergent tunnels for the PCL. This uh, is fiber wire for the for the, the posterior root avulsion fixation. And uh, for the PLC, we again use the Larson loop technique because of the graph. These are the post-op x-rays and you can see the fixations in a good manner. And this is the nine month uh, post-operative uh, follow-up of this patient. And the patient is able to undergo his, his uh, activities of going back to sports and this patient approximately uh, one and a half years down the line. So another patient of another PLC injuries, we, we actually, in this, this we used uh, the ACL for, we used uh, the quadricep, uh, the uh, graft because of the fact that the tendons were not thick enough. So again, this is for the, another patient with KD3, KD3 uh, medial side in which the MCL is actually torn. You can actually well appreciate the quadricep tendon, the, PLC, uh, the, the PCL along with your PLC reconstructions there. Then uh, another patient with ACL and PCL injury, KD2 uh, in this. And uh, in the last, there's a patient with PCL with MCL injuries. And uh, you can well appreciate the tendons are actually gone. And so far, so forth, we actually did a PLC reconstruction using uh, reconstructing both the sides with the posterior oblique ligament and the central tendon for the MCL. So uh, coming up to uh, the, the, the expectations that we actually uh, follow the patient, uh, we actually tell the patient that they will be able to go and go, uh, go back into their kneeling sort of an activities in our, and our target is to achieve a full range of motion for the knee and giving them uh, not promising a full range of motion for going back into sports because of the fact that the, some of our patients does have gone back into sports, but that is not the usual norm of the experience that we actually see. And the paper that we have actually written up, we have actually, uh, we had 12 patients were there. We actually were able to put a very good Lissom knee score, 85.8 plus minus three, which is a good score. But uh, if you look at the IKDC score, eight of our patients were graded as A, three were B, and one patient was graded as C because of the fact that he developed an arthrofibrosis and uh, they, they had to undergo again for the surgery to, uh, for, to release of the arthrofibrosis, which gave him a very considerable good sort of a range of motion in order for him to return to, back to uh, his normal activities. So the take home message is, it's a complex uh, 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 surgery. You need to actually plan your surgery really well. 
decisions are not simple and, and they have to be uh, taken in very close accommodation. Uh, the early management may benefit, but our study shows that delayed and stage management, we are actually uh, coping up to a delay because of the fact that uh, the cost constraints of this patient that we actually offered the patient and it's very high and we actually, the patients are not actually willing to undergo for a second sort of surgery in a delayed sort of reconstruction. So we opted a delayed single stage surgery, but again, this thing requires a lot of teamwork efforts and uh, a group of people and great minds working together to, in order for you to achieve. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I've been lucky enough, me and Dr. Kazim have been working in a close collaboration to actually make this thing possible. So this is all about our experience regarding uh, the multi-ligamentous uh, knee reconstructions. So I thank you very much, Osama, for uh, bringing us back again onto this educational line. And uh, uh, I thank you very much. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Osama. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sufyan. Uh, you are very well on time. Always showing us, uh, uh, we have a lot to look up to. A very beautifully uh, placed and uh, described everything. Mashallah, you both are doing a good job there, Dr. Kazim. So uh, the next talk we have uh, from uh, Dr. Munawar Shah uh, uh, from UK. And uh, he's going to guide us uh, through all the uh, guidelines for the safe return to orthopedic procedures. So we are back to the COVID stuff. And I believe that we have to live with it for the next uh, couple of years. So over to Dr. Manavar Shah, you can guide us better about uh, what are exactly the latest uh, guidelines for the NHS and what exactly he's doing these days. So Dr. Manavar Shah, you can take over. So by asking me doing last, it is like everybody's shown me that Shadi ki videos, now it might turn everybody's gone home. I can see people. <laughs> no, we're getting more participants now. It's 50 plus. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We have a huge audience I, for you. I have, I have, I've been given a very difficult topic. Topic. It's out of my comfort zone. But I will try to make just this straight like and then see if I can make it any good. I normally do clinical stuff. So again, like I said, it is very difficult. You have to be patient with me. But it is what we are doing at the moment at the NHS in UK. So hopefully, uh, uh, we'll show you a picture and hopefully you can take whatever you want to take from it. So it is my take on it, not what is happening around the world. Okay. So you've already been up to date. You've already had a, a webinar last week on the subject from your POA uh, uh, forum. And obviously your POA has also gone and, and made a, a, you know, a, a SOP for it. So you're all, all well versed with it and you're all there and you know what's happening all around you and you have done what it is, okay? So it's a pandemic uh, and because of pandemic, it affected us and all the orthopedic work collectively was stopped. And it was an international emergency response required. And I'll show you what happened. So you can see uneducated people responding cleverly, but educated people in America are taking sun UV lights to make them better. So you take a pick. The best information came from Pakistan, which said instead of soap, if you gave them good root, they may not even talk about COVID anymore, right? That's it. So the, 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 the theme was that you need to have what is called PPE. And if you had PPE, you were okay. And before, when it all started, PPE was non-existent and at least 180 healthcare workers in UK lost their lives for COVID. And it was predominantly BAME, which is black, Asian, and more, uh, you know, uh, uh, ethnic minority. So the message that went out to everybody was stay home, save the NSS and save life, okay? And to create capacity, uh, all hospital had to redeploy their staff and try to do only acute emergency cases. And BOST, which is a combination of BOA and various other authorities came in guidelines for all of us at the time. It was in April when the guidelines came out. And what it basically said that plan author should be on hold, social distancing applied, virtual clinic started, and limited face-to-face -face appointments. And they came up with a plan to divide orthopedics into five categories, emergency, urgent, something that could wait for four weeks or more, something that could wait for three months or more, and something that could be delayed beyond three months. This is the plan they were going to work on. Okay. And they describe what goes into emergencies, what goes urgent, what is level two, what is level three, and what is level four. Okay. Various things. You understand arthroplasty uh, uh, was level four, tumors was level two, and trauma with you know, hip fractures and various other open fractures was level one. And this was basically done for the managers to plan surgical resources and to redeploy their, their troops. Okay. 
stage one came into place and it was minimizing hospital visit. It, the patients were triaged virtually, i.e. to a computer or telephone and visitors were restricted to hospital. Elective operation, elective clinics were totally stopped from 16th March of 2020 until further notice. And all meetings between teams surgeons and managers was done by Microsoft Teams, which was a software that was distributed to all the NHS workers. And because uh, 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 various other forums are not safe, you cannot transmit uh, uh, patient details. A new forum came in, which is just like uh, WhatsApp, but it's called Silo, and it's a very secure forum between people. I think we have our colleague here, Mr. Osan. He was the person who brought Silo into the trust. Okay. So my computer, got, oh, that's it. So virtual fracture clinic was a reality now. All patients that had trauma were moving around in the ambulatory, had to be screened by a surgeon on a telephone and then decided whether he needed to have an appointment in the clinic face to face or need to be sent back to the GP and discharged. The virtual desktop, which is my computer system from which I can see x-rays and patients details were transferred for, for all of us to be at home so that we can look at x-rays and give advice. The virtual fracture clinic was a very effective way in reducing follow-up visits. And the concept of working from home came, all right? And this is a new thing. We were talking about it, but this was a reality and this is what we worked with. I don't know why, but... And we started doing uh, uh, um, social distancing and we had patients, when patients used to come in, they used to have a questionnaire and a screening done for COVID-19 symptoms and the social distances were being practiced. Our operating theaters were changed and we had now to do donning and doffing and then we had to clean theaters, go into there, and then go from the other side. And I know why uh, Trump got this word Lysol because we clean our shoes with Lysol when we come out of theaters. So hopefully he thought that Lysol would kill viruses for everything. Okay, and we described words called aerosol generating procedures, and that's what was making us all safe by understanding what it means. And what it meant was we continued using the laminar flow theaters. We wanted PPE with masks and visors and gap and, and caps and everything, and, and a whole process was evolved, which was donning and duffing, i.e. putting guns to go and operate and then taking everything off while we're coming out of theatres to make it all safe for everybody. Okay, so all theatre traffic was minimised. A runner was dedicated with walkie-talkie. He used to stay outside, take messages from inside because he couldn't go inside. It was a clean place. And everything that was needed was transferred to them through a clean environment. We always used absorbable sutures to make sure that we didn't have to bring them back for removal of sutures or stuff like that. Uh, additionally, uh, there was time taken for air exchange with the laminar flow because with, with, with uh, aerosol generating uh, organisms or procedures with aerosol generating uh, um, substances, you need to have a clean time. So once the anesthetic, which is the maximum time for generating, uh, the, the person had uh, to stay with uh, the patient until the laminar flow cleaned the theater, which was anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes as evidence says. Obviously now you realize with donning, doffing, and cleaning, the efficiency of theaters became 50%. So, and, and a guideline came out on how to do all these things from, from the NHS. We were not taking any post-op managers, especially of necrophemas. So it allowed the radiographers to have time to do other things and not just doing, keep doing necrophemas and, and other trauma mixes, which we had image pictures of already anyway. So it, it meant that the theater time was now increasing from, for, for per patient by 65 to 80%. And obviously the donning, doffing and the additional time for cleaning theaters was, was taking its toll. However, the, the department was also aware of the fact that we have to deploy our staff to be used efficiently for other things if they were not needed where they were and we had to be, have a redeployment and an ITU rotor, okay? Which meant that our juniors doctors were reassigned to covered wards and there was uh, uh, staff testing so that staff sickness and all that can be protected and the health of the staff and patient was vital. So we worked in a pattern of 333. We work in three days on call, three days in ITU and three days of a cooling off period. We had a standby person who was actually going to come in if something went wrong or somebody got sick and we were isolating some, some surgeons because of their immunity, their age or because they were of Asian or ethnic minority. And, and therefore they were given the task of doing the face-to-face -face clinic triaging, i.e. they would call patients, talk to them, and if they felt they needed a face-to-face -face appointment, they were brought into service. And this is what happened then, you know? We sent out this poster to say, if you want an orthopedic surgeon to treat you for pneumonia, stay home, okay? And this is a picture that Sufjan sent me where apparently a nail has been superimposed and looks like endotacal intubation has been done that way, but that's not true, it's just a fake picture. Okay? Mm. So we had to have a plan. 
the plan was that, that we were going to go and treat pandemic uh, uh, COVID, but everything else was stopped. Especially people who were vulnerable, such as people with cancers and life threatening conditions were discouraged to attend hospitals, which meant fewer surges were done for them and they were being uh, kept uh, away from the hospital. I guess, okay. And, and, and this was to, to make sure that we have space for COVID patients and we were prepared to postpone all non-urgent elective operations for three months at least. That was the NHS directive, okay? And an immediate effect was the COVID patients were being looked after. The bad effect was that the healthcare system was deprioritized and therefore there would be a long-term consequence from it, okay? Every month in non-COVID times, 700,000 procedures are done on the surgical side, not just orthopedics, the surgical side, and 35% of these are orthopedics. Now, if you ask all these patients to wait for three months, what's going to happen? We all know what's going to happen, like I say. Okay, so we need to have a look at it. These are specialty surgical procedures done on the NHS every, yeah, uh, every month, sorry. And you can see trauma and orthopedics, we do more than 50,000 procedures a year, a month, sorry. Okay, and, and that meant that the waiting list time would have to go up for these patients. These are not private patients, these are patients with NHS, uh, uh, you know, patients that are done on, on the state. And if you can see the orthopedic patients are waiting uh, uh, more, than, more than 10 months to have surgery, sorry, 10 weeks, and then they are waiting about a million which we need to have surgery in the future. So that's bad. And, and if you look at all the waiting patients, uh, the trauma and orthopedics takes priority and we are adding 20,000 patients every month into the system. So something has to be done. This is a predicted uh, a graph which says that by 2020, we will double the number of waiters having surgery done in, in time. So we have to do something. We, have to, we can't just do COVID all the time and we have to start plan orthopedics, which meant that people may not even be uh, ready to have, be considered for surgery until six months from the time they come to see somebody and if the NHS worked at 125% capacity for what it is present, it may take two years for them to be actually dealt with, which means for us to go back to where we were before COVID would be in the next five years. And that's something that is not acceptable to most people. If you're injured or hurt, you want to be seen and sorted out, okay? So a plan had to be devised. A plan had to be devised and a strategy had to be done to make sure that we need to do, get all these patients covered. And the important thing was, that we have to do on an average 200 operations more per year in each theater to get back to norm, which meant purchasing extra services on the private sector. That was equal to 750 NHS theaters per year. So we had to go into the private sector to see if we could buy time. And a mixture of improving efficiency and private theater may increase the capacity of theater by 25%. So that's a very dark figure. This is, this is difficult to understand. So while this was happening, we were all getting respect. You know, you could get into the queue ahead in the supermarket. You were a hero, you were a doctor, you were treating virus. And every Thursday at 7 p.m., everybody used to get out of where they were and then cheer the, the health workers. And this is, was fine. We even had statues put in places of doctors, okay? And then we were superheroes, okay? We are coming to reality now and recovery has to start because we just can't do COVID. So Simon Stevens, the NHS chief executive, told all chief executive that you have 10 days to look at your capacity and make uh, plans for, for, for the people who are not having surgery, i.e. non-COVID patients. So my computer is getting stopped now. Okay, so we need to have a prioritization list. And this was uh, a guideline from BOA and various specialities that we have to make sure that we have patients, we know where they are, we know which ones need to be in category two and category three, which we need to give them time and start working with them, okay? So the, the sign changed from stay at home to stay alert, to save life. And, and the level in England fell from level one to level two, which means we were moderately safe now, okay? But that was because this end of stay order was because we now have capacity in ICU, so you can go out, so if you get in trouble, we can take you into ICU. It was not because the virus had disappeared, like, isn't it? So in the absence of vac vaccine, we have to be very careful because it is not safe. And, and the little evidence we have is from one which suggests that the findings are very concerning. And what they say is that, for example, if you had a hip replacement during COVID times, a normal routine patient who was totally normal, had no COVID symptoms, his comorbidity was 65%, and 35% died from having a hip replacement in COVID times in the hospital. Now that's scary, you know, if you're going to have a hip replacement and you don't have COVID and you have a chance of dying 35%, that's bad, okay? in every book. So we had to make sure that we had patient safety was a priority. We need to make green corridors. 
and we need to make space for people to have surgery done on level two and level three priorities. So the NHS gave out a roadmap for safety plan. It was a checklist for restarting electrical, elective surgery services. And it said you have to have 10 points before you can start elective service in a hospital. And the first thing was that there is enough capacity to deal with a COVID patient and there is ITU beds available. And you have, if you are going to do elective surgery, it will not adversely impact on the emergency services. The second checklist was you have enough PPP, PPE, you have clear policies and you know when to use them. Third checklist was that have you got independent, uh, sorry, independent services available such as physiotherapy, sterility, pathology and everything else, in, including anesthesia. The fourth checklist was that patient and staff should be frequently ch uh, checked for COVID testing and they should have enough capacity to do it. The fifth criteria was the forgotten few that the media used to talk about. All the newspapers said you've been forgotten by the NHS. So a high quality data was supposed to be collected to make sure that the people who had deferred surgery were being prioritized. Okay, then uh, we need to make sure that we had green hospitals or COVID negative facilities for operating rooms and for physiotherapy and post-op rehab. We had to make sure that after COVID we had enough theater capacity to have a protected enhanced service and mostly this was done in the independent sector so up to now i don't know what happened in pakistan but in the uk all the private sectors were closed and the independent se sector was hired by the nhs to work uh, some of the patients out there okay we need to make sure that the surgical workforce was available to do this and we had to revise job plans for everybody this was the eighth part the ninth was that local coordination should be done so if a hospital has a facility and beds and the other doesn't we share our uh, uh, facilities in a geographic area okay and finally uh, a management team was scheduled by the nhs uh, locally and, and nationally to make sure that they communicated with each other most most uh, uh, problems were shared and there were solutions to find out uh, now after we did that we would uh, make sure that all 10 safety elements were present and then we started working with our with our uh, uh, planned patients Okay, and the, the ma main infrastructure was that it had to be a COVID-free hospital or COVID-free areas in a large general hospital, or we had uh, SOPs for all these patients. So we, we were going to grade urgency, which we had already done in May. All of us went in through our list and uh, graded our patients. We were sure that there was ethics involved in it to make sure that people who had a hip replacement waiting to be done, and we didn't do it. And then it turned out that they were now totally off their legs and couldn't do anything. So the consent had to be very clear to tell people there is a higher risk in COVID times to come and have planned surgery. And obviously PPE was in the forefront of all this planning. So I was made uh, um, in charge of looking after local or, or the minor surgery, but we had a plan process where all our planned surgery went to the local independent sector, which was green and COVID free and four weeks of more patients that were waiting were now being uh, triaged. Uh, we had a, relocated all our local anesthetic and minor surgery to a GP service minor surgery, and we converted our hospital in such a way, which is not more capacity than we're supposed to, but enough to have one list for orthopedics a week. So at the moment of the 10 surgeons, five are working, everybody else has been protected, so we are going to have a one in five list on Monday, <clears throat> which is going to be the green part of the hospital, okay? We had an SOP prepared for us, and the SOP was for planned surgery, not local, and planned surgery local, okay? So for the planned surgery, every patient that was going to have, say, like a hip replacement, he was told at least 16 days in advance that you're gonna have surgery. He had a pre-op assessment, which was face-to-face, -face, an MRSA test was done, and a COVID serology test was done at the same time. Then the patient was told to shield himself for the next two weeks, that meant uh, on his own, in his house, not meeting anybody, not going outside, and make sure that uh, uh, he, if he did go and, and misbehave, then he was taken off the list. Then at seven days, the patient was phoned to confirm that you're going to have a second swab done. And if you're going to have a second swab done, uh, are you sure you didn't go out and you, you, you stay at home? This is very difficult to ask somebody to stay at home for two weeks when they have nothing wrong with them, but that's what we said but to protect the surgeon and the patient. This is what the rules were. At day seven, there was again, sort of like I said, asked to, to, to tell them when they can come in. At day three, another swab was done before surgery and, and the results were given to them and if it was negative day one before surgery, the nurses that were being involved in surgery was told that the patient arrived on day zero and another swab was done at that time to make sure that he was safe 
to have surgery and it was not going to affect the, the surgical team and stuff because it was a green hospital. For planned surgery, local anesthesia, it was a bit easier. There was a telephone questionnaire which was asked that in seven days that he had symptoms of COVID. Did he have, or was it with anybody who had symptoms in the last 14 days? If he said no to both of them, then it was a low risk and it was done at a, a local uh, a surgical unit. Alternate site and steroid use restriction, COVID was also discussed with the patient at the same time. So on the day of the visit, there was about 12 things that was done. Basically, PPP questionnaires repeated, temperature taken, wearing masks and all that kind of stuff. As soon as we told everybody that we were open, this is what happened. Everybody wants to have their surgery done yesterday. So it was a very nice saying from Benjamin Franklin, one of the early American presidents who says, out of adversity comes opportunities. So I was given the task to run the minor surgical unit. So we went into a local GP practice and we looked at their service. They had three minor theaters, a waiting room and, and a surgeon's room and, and a, a record of file room and a reception. And we thought this was ideal for us. So we converted this into minor surgical. I'm very blessed because I've got a lot of facilities that Arfix provided me. So I have ultrasound, I have PRP, IP, ACPs, endoscopes, and the whole lot. And this is the setting that we had. So I have an ultrasound guided service where we were injecting them with ultrasound guidance or assessing their shoulders if we want to. This is the setup for that. Then the stocks are filled. So I have ACP glow. I have loads, whatever I want to do, including tender ACPs. And like I said, you know, um, adversity brings opportunity. Now I have monocytes in my cupboard. Pre previously, I had to beg to get some of these, but now it's in my cupboard. We have nanoscopes for us to use. These are the disposable kits that you have with the nanoscope. And we are uh, one of the pioneers in working in the system in the whole of UK, and everybody's coming to look at us now. So the Artex decided to change the ACP kit into a completely packed disposable unit, which means that the, the double syringe, the low lock, the tourniquet, the, the uh, you know, the butterfly and the uh, steri strips and the band-aid or everything was all in the same package. This is our minor surgical package, which means that if you are doing carpal tunnels or everything else, you have a disposable packet. You, you use this and throw it away. You don't have to clean it or do anything with it. Okay. Uh, we, were, we have an ultrasound handheld portable device, uh, which does all these things. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, like a big machine, it works on your telephone and you press this and it does the calibration for you. So this is my list for next week. Uh, you can see I have loads of injections, they're all PRPs, and I have arthroscopy, which means P uh, I'm doing nanoscopes. So we, we are at the forefront of providing a service. Okay, the ultrasound does everything and also does needle enhancement, so it shows me what I want to do. So this is my first hip injection, which I don't do. I only do shoulders, but unfortunately, when you do an injection in the clinic, this is what you do. So this is the neck and head. This is the capsule. This is, if you're very clever, you can see the needle coming down there into the capsule to inject directly into your hip joint. Okay, I started doing tendo ACPs. And this is a system. This is a, a, a plantar fascia. So you can see the heel and the plantar fascia on a long term. And this is my needle coming into the plantar fascia. So as Sufyan says, I'm now an injection king. Now I do a lot of injections out of my comfort zone. One of my patients were told that you can only have ultrasound guided tennis elbow injections. So this is PRP into the elbow. This is the radial head, epicondyl. And this is the, the sac after we fill PRP into the, the uh, bursa of the, or the remnant of the bursa of the tendon, uh, under the tendon. This is a dynamic uh, ultrasound, so you can actually see the radar move and you know where everything is. This is a TFCC injection uh, under ultrasound guidance. This is normal shoulder <coughs> ultrasound, which shows the biceps with fluid in it, which means there uh, must be a tear. This is the subscap with the bipinate muscle, and this is a tear that we figured out, and this patient is now being listed to have an arthroscopic repair done at the manor for the main hospital. So RTX also has given me an SOS scoring system. So everybody that I'd put PRP in goes into the database so that we can have a national uh, or an international data for all these patients that we've done. We have taken 70 patients off the list from the clinic, from theaters, which means that we have created capacity. Okay, so this is the future, which is what we call the new norm. Okay, it's the new norm. We have to learn to live with the new norm. And the new norm is working smarter, PPE, and testing has to be the future. Virtual clinics are here to stay. Most meetings of the team should be on media. Prioritization is essential. We have to think out of the box and some procedures in the future have to be moved to clinics rather than hot theaters. Okay, in summary, 
if you want to restart process a uh, plant surgery in Pakistan, you need to have those 10 things. Uh, you have to have capacity, you need to have tests, and you need to be able to isolate patients for two weeks before they can have plant surgery. You have to have PPE for you to make sure that you're safe. You need to also make sure that you have green hospitals. Green hospital means no COVID virus has been there or has been cleaned off. If you can't do this, you're at a risk and your patient is at a risk. As you can see from the summary or from evidence we have from China, that in COVID times, if you do plant surgery, there is a high mortality and mobility associated with it. So I'm happy with questions if you're all happy for it, but it was out of my comfort zone, so I'm not sure whether you guys liked it or not. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Whenever you have done a great job uh, walking us through all the uh, guidelines and uh, what you have been through lately. So it's beautiful how you have been doing all this stuff and uh, you're embarking on uh, Nanoscope uh, in the near future. So we'd love to see how you do it and we'll love, we would love to uh, see uh, how you manage to uh, plan it. So I hope you announce uh, the date and when you'll be available for the next Nanoscope session and we'll be happy to attend that. So there you go, you know, uh, we got 30 people left. So you have to show all the wedding videos in my wedding. It's a 50 plus. Okay, but you are not. You are not. You are not. You are Dr. Umar Bhatt. Dr. Kamran Bhatt was also. He has a commitment to go to the hospital. He is playing. He is playing. First, you ask him, how did he sit in isolation? How did he reach Ireland? How did he reach Ireland? How did he go to the hospital? Private jet, sir. Private jet. Private jet, okay. So guys, questions? First question we received from Dr. Aisha, uh, from Dr. Umarbar. Dr. Umar, can you see? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Osama. Yeah, Dr. Aisha asked a question from you that, um, uh, what is the youngest age of a patient with ACL injury have you seen so far? And how often do you receive pediatric patients with sports injuries? Uh, quite a lot. Uh, majority of the pediatric patients age, which I see come across are under 16. I would say I have seen very rarely under 10. It's mostly between 10 and 16. Uh, most of them are with uh, either uh, ACL avulsion injury because their physis is still not fused, so they are much more prone to develop avulsion. And uh, the femoral sided avulsion are also quite common or uh, proximal tear, which I call them. So do I do see them, but obviously comparing to an uh, adult population, they are much less. Uh, but I do treat pediatric ACL injuries quite seriously. My choice are always, like Amir mentioned, that if there is an avulsion, I would fix them. It's all about the timing. If they are delayed, the healing is much less in avulsion. But if they are acute, they are just the dream come true. They fix very nicely. I would, like Amir mentioned, I would prefer doing arthroscopic fixation. And if they're proximal, uh, I would prefer in a younger population repair. I don't do reconstruction. Uh, that's my choice. So, uh, Amir Krash is not here, which is a sad thing, but he does a lot of pediatric ACL injuries. In England, there's yeah, a lot sure. of uh, uh, athletic pediatrics uh, guys doing sports injuries. They're playing uh, basketball and football at a very early age. And he has a, a series of doing ACL reconstructions. He tries to do them extra articular, he said. And if not extra articular, then what he does is he will take the graft from the family or the parents. I think Fahad is online. Fahad was his fellow, and maybe he can tell us a bit. Fahad? Yes, no, you're gone. Yeah, but he does, and he does an extra articular fixation possibly most of the time. So. Guys, give me a second. I'll just open up the door. Give me a second. Sure, take your time. While we're doing that, can we have another question? Uh, yeah, there was another question from Dr. Sufyan. I want you to uh, answer it verbally here that, uh, as you uh, said, it's a delayed reconstruction you prefer. So, uh, what was the uh, duration? Six weeks, uh, three months? six months and uh, why would you, uh, if it's recommended, what better results and outcome you have seen with the delayed reconstruction of uh, multiple ligament injury? Yes, uh, regarding the uh, met preferred method of uh, reconstruction, the reason that uh, we chose delayed is because of the fact that we want everything to actually heal. If you're looking at the, the MCL injury, it depends upon the the, uh, the Schneck classification that what are you looking at. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at uh, a, a, a simple uh, a ACL uh, injury, my least time is three weeks, and I will not go in before three weeks. If you're looking at a multi ligament injury in which your collaterals are involved, my preferred time is at least at least six weeks. I put them in a brace, I put them in a hinge brace, and I advise them to go undergo graduated sort of full range of motion of the knee in order for the knee to regain back as much as of the kinematics as uh, possible. 
Now, uh, in my uh, the study that we have actually done, a uh, few of our patients were actually not able to achieve full range of motion before uh, up till approximately eight to 10 weeks. So we, we had to go in and do, did the reconstruction as well. One of the patients did well, but one did not do uh, that well in terms of achieving full range of motion. 120 degrees is achieved, but it's not able to actually squat down and uh, kneel down in pairs. So my uh, preferred choice is actually for uh, the ligaments to actually, the extra-articular ligaments to go as into as much healing pit as possible. So not before six weeks and depending, and my only prerequisite is actually go and see, uh, have a full range of knee, range of motion in order for uh, the knee to regain back its kinematics once the reconstruction is complete. Okay, Dr. Zohar oh, is there, sir. Dr. Zohar. Hope that answers your question, Dr. Sufyan. If there any question, you can ask directly from Dr. Sufyan. Uh, sir, um, I would like to add or rephrase my question. Uh, I was asking if a patient represents you after a chronic injury, like after six months or after nine months, will you uh, uh, address the patient in the same way or uh, you will uh, defer the reconstruction or uh, you uh, just plan in a different way? Uh, Zoha, any injury which is presenting after six, to, six months to, uh, or nine months, now, in that case, uh, if it is presenting in approximately nine months on a year, my uh, more, uh, I mean, focus will be on the mechanical axis of the patient. So I would like to go for a scanogram first. And if the patient has, because as much healing I was expecting uh, it to be, it has already been done in approximately six months or approximately nine months. So for patient presenting in six to nine months of injury, I would not like to uh, wait further actually uh, prevent them into or taking them into reconstruction i will evaluate the uh, the uh, the the index score and which how many ligaments are broken and then i will actually go for a scanogram an mri a fresh mri and uh, depending upon the expectation of the patient the reconstruction can be proceeded depending upon what how many ligaments are basically torn uh, in the knee so if you're, you're not oh, talking in the osteotomy you, world now isn't it we are we are not looking at just reconstructions anymore like isn't it so you can, you can repair, you can reconstruct, and you can salvage. Now you're getting into the salvage stage, isn't it? Uh, I think uh, salvage state is basically the phenomena that uh, is getting uh, into norm uh, more of these days as people are actually going into repairs. Many of the structures, they are actually going in, uh, in, in, into the phases of early repairs or, or either into late repairs. So my preferred choice is that I have actually taken, I have taken my patients into in a multi-ligamentous setting is a reconstruction. So working and onto a repair, what does the literature say as us, what the data actually says that that's yet to be actually proven that how much of a repair that would be in, in, in future, in coming future, that how much will it be of useful or not. But my preferred choice is going into a reconstructed reconstruction phase if you're looking at uh, the collaterals. And obviously, if you're by many a times because we are seeing a lot of avulsion injuries in sort of the chronic avulsion injuries of the PCL avulsion or the ACL avulsion uh, in the, these sort of phases. So again, going into uh, uh, in, uh, whenever I'm entering a multi-ligamentous uh, setting, my preferred choice is going into a reconstruction rather than going into and uh, in, uh, repairing these structures. Uh, thank you, Dr. Spran. There's another question for Dr. Umar, but <clears throat> uh, uh, you've been practicing in Pakistan about the, most of the ACL uh, strategy. So another question is uh, about the Rubin strategy. Uh, when did you most see the patients coming to you for the Rubin ACL uh, after six months or before six months? First question. Second, if you uh, get the patients about the region, uh, what was uh, the main cause in your patients? Uh, did you find out about the failure of the ACL? Uh, it's it's mostly chronic uh, in Pakistan. When I see patient for revision surgery now, recently I started seeing them a uh, few weeks or few months down the line. But uh, in the early years of practice here, majority of them were chronic. Almost two years, three years down the line, they had open ACL. A majority had metallic screw. Mostly the cause of failure, as I mentioned in the presentation as well, was uh, uh, tunnel malposition. So mostly our vertical tunnels. Second cause of failure is infection. So in Pakistan, uh, infection is the second cause which I've seen, which is obviously self-explanatory. Uh, unfortunately, not use of disposable drapes, multiple use of shavers, and uh, 
these can and prolonged surgery can cause infection to the patient um, but majority of the patients who are coming now are obviously because of social awareness and much more educated class are understanding the injury is treatable in this country as well having a lot of colleagues doing the same procedures so they do come approach they do come to you very early so i do see them early now but previously it was two three years down the line uh, with regards to um, uh, what Munawar mentioned about uh, parental donation, uh, I want to add that, that yes, that's the possibility. Uh, but in the last uh, uh, 12 months, eight systematic reviews have been published on primary ACL repair. So I think the speed of ACL repair is picking up. Multiple surgeons are showing keen interest. I do them regularly. I have got very good results. And I think it's, it's just a, an, another tool in the box. Uh, you need to have another tool in the box. So if you see that this patient can have a good repair, it's much more less invasive. It doesn't cause any pain. You haven't burned the bridges. And if it fails, you can still do reconstruction. So I think that's the thought process uh, behind a repairer group uh, rather than reconstruction, because we must understand that the reconstruction carries much more higher morbidity uh, to the patient and pain comparing to a repair. So I do agree there are various uh, options, like many ways to skin a cat, but I would still, in my choice, would prefer repairing in a younger patient and um, even in an elderly patient. So that's the, that's the way I like to do it. And I feel in the next five years, you will see more and more repair published work coming out. Dr. Minerva, if you want to comment on this. So I think, uh, as, as Umar said very rightly, it's many ways of skinning the cat. Okay, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, um, um, element that you have. You can do it. I think uh, what he has stopped short of telling you is that Arthrex has developed a, a what is called a, a, a rope that augments it, and it's called an internal brace. So if you're repairing it and put an internal brace on it, that helps. Saying that, uh, we are a bit behind the world in England. Uh, most of America is doing that, and most of America is proposing that. In England, we are still doing extra articular repairs. For children i'm not sure how long that's going to last but we don't have a, an expert from england on knees here but i think what they're doing in young children is doing an extra articular repair purely, purely because they're worried about the physis that's all that means uh, 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 andy stevenson from cambridge he's doing acl repair using internal brace uh, gordon mckay from scotland who is an inventor of uh, internal brace is doing a lot of acl repair using internal brace so there are a few guys uh, obviously, if you are um, a knee surgeon in, in England, you, you know the colleagues, they are uh, doing it that. The problem in England is that you can't run a randomized control trial comparing ACL repair versus reconstruction. And the same problem is happening all over the world, even in USA. Uh, yesterday, I had a talk with Grigor de Phyllis, and he said the same thing, that it's a challenge to do a randomized control trial. A lot of people initially didn't agree, but now more and more uh, younger surgeons or experienced ACL surgeons are looking at the proximal tear, which is still attached, type 1 Sherman, uh, can be repaired and they are having almost five years follow-up results. Uh, more than, I would say, 300 ACL repairs done by Grigor. And uh, there are multiple ways of repairing it, not necessarily internal brace. You can do uh, uh, internal brace, you can do dynamic interligament stabilization, you can do uh, a sim single anchor repair. So there are multiple ways. The aim is to prevent, uh, keep the proprioceptive fibers, keep the natural anatomy and kinematics. And I think that is the way uh, to look into that. Um, uh, but at the same time, I feel when a reconstruction is required, it is an amazing operation to do. And Dr. Uh, Sidhan, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, one thing that there are two different scenarios around here. One thing is that we are looking at a repair in an isolated setting. For example, if you got one ligament which is torn. And the other thing is that you're looking at a repair in a multi-ligamented setting. These two are, two, two are totally separate areas of interest. Well, when you, when you go inside a multi-ligamentous knee joint, there's virtually nothing that you see as which can be labeled as a cruciate ligament. There's absolutely open play ground for you to actually play. And it's uh, at times, I find it much more easier to do a PCL reconstruction uh, in a multi-ligamentous setting. And it's easier at the time conserving because you don't have an ACL in front of you. So uh, regarding the repair, I mean, uh, there have been data that have been actually showing, I agree with everyone up around here that has showing that good results in an isolated setting. And I would like to educate it that as well, because of the fact that if you are coming up with a randomized control trial or a level one study, plus we need to remember that we practice here in Pakistan. In Pakistani population, we do have got very, very 
fin much financial constraint with the patient and they mostly come to you for one short sort sort of a surgery because of the fact that if you if you if you offer them an experimental surgery the the moment you're going to uh, bring out the term experimental from your mouth they're they're not going to be i mean uh, going for it plus one thing is that that i have got uh, regarding the internal bracing i am a good educator of extra articular structures going for bracing so just like mcl it works beautifully i mean we have done it for extra articular uh, uh, bracing with the mcl it works really well but for intra articular structures in a multi ligamentous setting i mean for the, because i said i have only presented around 12 papers and my total number is going up one up to 24 I have not seen as yet a remnant tissue to actually go and repair it. But in an isolated setting, I would agree with every one of us that there has been data, there have been publications which are there, and hopefully, let's uh, wait for a level one study to actually come up into that, and hopefully, that might, uh, I mean, change the 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 whole uh, the practice uh, in sports medicine. Sufyan, so I'll add on that. First of all, uh, uh, it is not an experimental study because paper has been published in Gesta. Uh, Murray has published results from USA since 2015. Uh, Gordon McKay has got more than 60 uh, follow-up of four years with good results. Dynamic intraligament stabilization has been done more than 300 patients' uh, results. And uh, uh, concerning the publication, uh, Grigor De Felis has published more than 25 papers on primary ACL repair. So there are enough now evidence to support its use because on the long term, two and a half years to five years follow up are available. Your question regarding multi ligament is completely uh, justifiable. Uh, there are people who are doing multi ligament reconstruction, uh, and they are repairing some structures. like for example when you do multi ligament reconstruction and in not every scenario some scenario you see that the acl is partially torn you repair the acl and then you do pcl reconstruction and you can also repair mcl in a fresh setting as you know that mcl fibers are there and you can open it up and repair them so as i said in the beginning i think we are all going through the evolutionary phase the new things are coming up people are showing their results but as a, as 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 you rightly mentioned that you have to be very careful looking at the patient's social circumstances if the patient is willing to accept this challenge that this can be the risk that it will fail and we will go through the reconstruction so you have to be an honest surgeon and tell the patient that i'm doing the repair there is almost 85 to 90% chance it won't fail but there is still 10% risk of failure comparing to reconstruction which is 98% successful and if the patient accept your counseling and accept that that challenge they are happy to take then yes otherwise i fully agree that you should not offer patient a procedure in which the failure rate is high so i do come across patients who are willing to take that risk or family member are happy to to consider that and as i said that i have now in two years done over 50 repairs and i don't have a single failure i because my patient selection criteria was very strict i try to do them when they are over 30 i don't they do them in a very young age and uh, as i said if they are acute under 6 months good biology and all always, always keep reconstruction option available during theater so if i feel a repair is not possible i will do reconstruction on the same go yeah, i'm i'm going to make a statement omar and i hope you don't take it the wrong way and don't get upset with it like okay I was working in with this very esteemed surgeon, and I remember he asked me that how many shoulder arthroscopies you've done have failed, and I said to him, I have a very good selection criteria, and none of my patients fail. And he said, What about the patient that goes somewhere else? You can't count them, and you can't count them as failures. So you know, the statement to make that none of my patients have failed is a very no, very no, no, no. You're, you're taking whenever you are unfortunately taking it wrongly. I'm But saying I'm that in my case series. I'm saying that statement because we don't know. No, no, I, I can, I can make that statement because I'm saying that all my patients, I'm following them six months, three months, twelve months, and all of them are having MRI scan. All okay. of my patients go through MRI scan because this was part of my study to make sure that if they are failing, I have to obviously document that. So so far in two years, there is not a single failure. proven on mri scan we have done 30 mri scan we still got 20 patient to finish 6 months and they haven't failed maybe they will but at this stage uh, so much can i make a one topic hello yeah. hello assalam alaikum everyone falim salam welcome dr fazil how are you everyone i am just hearing a very nice debate going on uh, if we got, uh, if like uh, the topic of today uh, that we are discussing basically a multi ligament reconstruction and of course the uh, different controversies and different challenges that we have so uh, now the point is that repair versus re 
versus reconstruction. So this, uh, what the basically multi-ligament reconstruction, what it says about the repair versus the reconstruction. Uh, there are, multi of course, uh, the many, when we say repair, when we say reconstruction, the most important in this is the time of a surgery. When, when the patient presented to you, when you did the surgery. So if you are, uh, want to repair, if you could, uh, something come in mind, but like repair, it's like within a, uh, like it says within a, the literature says within a four weeks is the time that uh, you able to identify a tissue. After that, there is a fibrosis that the tissue is not well. Uh, you can see it. If you uh, say it's you want to go a reconstruction, this is a time of a surgery. That means you are uh, planning after six weeks. And in the repair, of course, it is uh, easy to do. It is more accessible. The tissue is very easily accessible. But at the same time, uh, there is a literature which has shown uh, repair of the MCL have sh uh, have given 35 percent of the failure. And that's uh, what it was shown in the literature, which uh, uh, we have gone through it. So, of course, again, the debates uh, is still on okay, repair versus reconstruction in the multi-ligament. That's what we are, uh, who are here, the, the topic of today is. So, of course, the, every surgeon has his own preference. If every surgeon knows okay, or what is his uh, want to uh, preferably do with the patient. Uh, that's what my uh, point of view is uh, about the repair was the reconstruction. There's a more failure in repair as per nurse literature, which has shown as compared to the nurse reconstruction and the timing of the surgery that matter a lot. And that's my comment about it. Dazim, you are absolutely right, and so is Sufyan. Uh, in multi-ligamentary injury, I fully justify and support the fact that reconstruction should be given a choice. We were not talking about comparison between ACL repair versus multi-ligament. In multi-ligament, you have a choice of doing reconstruction. This was like Sufyan mentioned, on isolated cases, an ACL repair is an option. You have an extra tool in the box which you can use in specific group of patients. So multi-ligament, 100% agree. Uh, yes, I have a question for Dr. Umar. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, hello. Hello. Is there anyone wants to ask any question? Hello. Hello. Yes, you hello. can speak. Because... Do you have any question? Hi. First of all, my name is Dr. Ashfaq Kunchwala. Congratulations to all of you with participating in this uh, multi Welcome, welcome Dr. Ashfaq. You're from Dubai, How right? Are... Yeah, I'm Dubai. Dubai and why I, I can't have... see? Why I can't see your charm? Because I am in, I am in between the two clinics. Of my surgery is cancelled, so I have an opportunity to talk to you people and watching and discussing about it. So I'd say, I also would like to say, Harry, hello to everybody, and I'm very impressed about the discussion which was going on, especially uh, the Munawar and you and Sophia. I think you're doing remarkable jobs, and think carry on this. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, Thank you. I'm very impressed. I think that's thank great. You, thank you, Dr. Okay. How how are things? Everything okay? So everything seems to be fine. You, no? Yeah, everybody's fine. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Before we go on, yeah, tell me about you. the Pakistan version of COVID. What was happening and what are your plans for starting? I, I, it looks like everybody has already started and, and, and Ashfaq and Dubai is already working. So how, how what, what are your safety measures? For the COVID? Uh, yeah. The, so the COVID starts. See what happened? I have it started we stopped the elective list and elective list uh, for four weeks and then because this is the right time for the player to go for the surgery because of the COVID time there was no uh, no sports so a lot of players who were waiting COVID for the is surgery. still there it's not gone yeah for, for me um, in and Dubai is almost gone so what happened we start operating we, I start doing the shoulder surgeries and the ACLs uh, how do you, how do you if, if, patient? What patients do you offer surgery? When when did so, say the so what's the question? Hello. So you, you know, I mean, there are a hundred thousand patients waiting here to have surgery, but we are selecting patients. How do you select your patients in Dubai? Same question. How do you select your patient in Pakistan? It's a, it's same uh, for me. Selecting is first of all I have to wait how urgent it. I think I saw a few a uh, little bit presentation. Uh, it's depend upon the patient criteria. The, three, four categories, how urgent it is. But in my scenario, because being a sports, what happened, I've been pushed up by different clubs, yeah, to take a risk in that. We, what we do, we, I have is, operated- Is you taking or is the patient taking a risk? Both, everything. But what we need to do, we so usually do a- Evidence that's been published in cover times, if you don't protect yourself, there is a 64% mobility and a 40% death. 
So uh, how are you going to justify that if something like that happens? You know, you can't, you can't just yeah. do operation and take a risk. So I, I start operating in end of April. No, no, not I time. I'm asking you, are you doing PPEs? Are you testing them? Are they being self-isolating? Yeah. All these things. No, what we do before, before we start, uh, I, for example, I booked the patient for the surgery. Uh, we do a COVID test and COVID test is valid for three days only. And if the patient is COVID negative and he's asymptomatic and there is no history of traveling or uh, a relevant history, we proceed. And we proceed like an MRSA protocol, everything uh, covered, double gloving and everything goes well. And I, I'm, most of the time I'm doing ACL surgery and shoulder surgery, which all water related. Not I've not operated any joint replacement or any open surgery What's in my related? clinical practice. Or aerosol generating a shark. Said it again. The water related surgery is aerosol generating, which is more I dangerous. know that, but we most of the time, especially the all the knee surgeries we've been operating is under spinal anesthesia. And according to the DHA guidelines over here, uh, you can operate if the surgery is within the two hours, you can operate regarding uh, if the COVID test is negative. For shoulder surgery, I understand we do uh, wait. Uh, and sometimes, most of the time, I'm going to say my surgery is usually shoulder surgery. I do within 60, 65 minutes. So the anesthesia is less than two hours in most of the cases. So they are One happy to do it. One second for a COVID virus to touch you, uh, Ashwak. You know, but that's not Alhamdulillah. Safe. Alhamdulillah. Umar, how do you do it in Pakistan? I don't know about the Pakistan. Uh, Umar? Uh, uh, Munawar, it's a very challenging question you asked me, obviously, because uh, I have a mother, 83 year old. My brother are very little. I was really worried and concerned. I was talking to the rest of the team as well. Now the problem is that that Pakistan is not like England. Pakistan is not like USA. You will not find a single hospital in Pakistan who is green. You will not find a single hospital. And I will challenge here in front of all my colleagues that find me a single hospital in Pakistan who will stay green till next year. They won't. So that's number one. Number two, now how should we proceed on an elective surgery? That's the debate. And what is the most safest way to doing it? And I think I do agree with uh, Munawar 100% that first of all, not do anything and sit home and not work. Second, if you are planning to work, then you have to take the safety measures. Number one, in my clinic, as I said, all patients who are coming to see me, they have to wear mask. I wear mask. I keep social distance. One patient come at one time. When they plan to do surgery, which I just started recently, I was also not doing I make sure that they have been quarantined for 14 days before they plan the surgery. Three days before coming, they have to do PCR. If PCR is negative and their family members are negative, then they are offered planned surgery. And in theater, I try to do only two to maximum three cases a day. In National Hospital Defense Lahore, where I'm practicing in Lahore and in Karachi, both the places we are following the same rules. The, there is a separate COVID ward which is completely unacceptable, I agree, but they have separate entrance, separate exit. The team who is working in theater is completely separate from the team who are working on the COVID unit. Even the anesthetic are separate, even the staff are separate. So this is at least basic things. And in the last one month, Alhamdulillah, I had four to five patients who were positive when they send me the report and I send them back home. They came back after 14 days negative and then we planned the surgery. And I don't think so. There is any other way I can find a solution. Sufyan, Kazim, and rest of the uh, uh, Amir is here, and rest of the guys, Mustafa actually also is here. They can tell us that I do not see any other way we can proceed with elective surgery to today. Regarding trauma, I fully justify that if patient is even COVID asymptomatic and got a fractured neck of femur, what will you do? We will send them home. You have to operate on them. You have to wear protective PPE. So if Jan is doing trauma, you can ask him that, is it any possibility that you can send a fractured neck of femur or a mid shaft femur fracture patient with COVID-19? So those, those are level one patients and they have to be done whether COVID present or not. When they are not doing emergencies, they are level the one. Uh, the, 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 the one thing which is a problem, uh, uh, Munawar, one thing is keeping the hospital green. There is no way we can do that in Pakistan. Now, there is no green hospitals in Pakistan, but we have a hospital which is not green, but we have now separated corridors, like you said. The red That's or the, the, the dark side is on one side. The surgeons, the nurses, the nieces do not mix with each other. We don't even talk to each other. We have separate ways of coming and going. And the other bit is the green hospital, 
which is what we've cleared up and uh, you know everything is all separate so that's the best thing that can happen in pakistan i think that's the model that pakistan can work on but i don't think so we should we should not worry about covid virus because yes we all want to operate and we all want to do it but we have to be keeping it a safe environment until covid disappears which i don't think is possible to absolutely uh, absolutely there is no other way we have to do testing we have to test we have to make sure patient is asymptomatic the family is tested and if everything is in the safe measures then you can plan the surgery and 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 there is no other option yeah. i don't think so the national health service like in dubai or abu dhabi we have been given a, a blanket immunity during covid times that everything that goes wrong we are protected however if they go to the civil court and say that i had no covid symptoms i went for a procedure and i'm now covid positive i can be sued in the civil court that that uh, uh, you know so, so i'm sure it is happening most so we have to be careful that's all i'm saying you know i'm not saying stop already the, all i'm the, saying the, 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 the uh, i've uh, as i said the patient needs to do covid test their family needs to do covid test if they are negative they have to be 14 days quarantine negative 3 days before then you plan the surgery otherwise i don't think so it is safe at all to proceed with elective surgery even if it's corporate yes i agree with you yeah, I, i would add to dr uman that uh, it's still not uh, <clears throat> the ladies because we have patients who have been tested negative for the pcr and still they got no symptoms but they infected others so we can't rely on tests also so dr manohar shah is right that we have to stay away be careful as much as possible so um, it's the need of the time so anybody is going to have any more questions yeah. yeah sure please go on dr manohar so, you can i just want to share my last screen here yeah? so before yeah. we can finish this off yeah so that's the next meeting will be on shoulders it is going to be in uh, four weeks time i we will uh, i mean uh, sama will give you a final date uh, because i am fed up we're talking about below the belt you have to get up the belt at some stage you make me talk on stuff that i have no clue of like i said and and i will give you my experience of the nanoscope you know we are working wonders with nanoscope in the moment we are doing balloons we are injecting cuffs we are you know doing diagnostic peak features so i think this is the way for the future especially if you can't bring everybody to the theater we we are very restricted with capacity in our hospital as is most of nhs in uk but so we are making use of various things i used to get on my knees to beg to get one of these i have now free access to this which is covid in the bad that's all i can say like because of covid uh, i have a lottery but this is where we're going to i will share you with my experience of uh, 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 nanoscopes and and uh, sama can pick up a uh, lot of nice talks for for the next time but within four weeks we are doing shoulders if that's okay with everybody unless somebody has a, a better plan yeah dr sufyan and dr uh, would you like to please uh, suggest any date or any, any availability of yours for the next uh, month we can have it in i have a provisional uh, date i have a yeah. date because i do a 3 and 3 and 3 you know so the next time i am able to do a talk is on the i think i've, I've texted it to you sama it's on the 26th of july is everybody happy with that I think I think that will be reasonable now. I have got no problem. It's a Sunday, right? It is yeah. a Sunday and same time, yeah. yeah. Same time, yeah. Dr. Umar Bhat, uh, if you have any you are available on that date? Is it there? <laughs> I think I think he left. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Um it was a nice discussion. It was a very nice discussion. And if you Osama can send us the video link because I have to forward it to some people to make sure what we do and so that people more people can join in the future. Yeah, yeah, it's been recorded so I will share it to all the participants who are interested in it. So I would like to thank you very much uh, to all the participants and the speakers. It was a great uh, at least session for me also very informative and very educational. I hope all the participants liked it and uh, for concluding your marks um, will be uh, continuing all the stuff educational stuff for all the activities just to engage everyone uh, during these times so thank you very much dr sufyan dr amir and dr manavar star from uk so i hope to see you guys soon thank you very much thank you so much thank you so stay much. safe yeah thank you thank you thank you very much